Welcome to the International School of Tailoring. My name is Reza and this is going to be your fifth lesson of our How to Make a Bespoke Jacket series. In the previous lesson, we looked at some templates. I highly recommend you visit the resources page of our website and download some of the most essential templates that we have provided you because you're going to be needing them in the upcoming lessons. In today's lesson, I'm going to talk you through all the materials that you need to follow along with me. You're going to have to make some decisions on buying some of these materials and I have to give you the best possible information to make that choice. So. I'm going to first give you an overview on all the materials that I have in front of me. Then I'm going to dive deeper into each one. And last but not least, I have a surprise for you. Ready? Let's go. You don't need the most expensive version of all these materials that I have in front of me. While the quality of your materials is very important, it's really your skill and expertise that makes that jacket valuable. So. The question that we're going to be answering in this lesson is what materials do you need to be able to make a jacket that along with your expertise and your skills is worth at least 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 pounds. So let's begin with an overview of all the materials that I have in front of me. First thing of course is going to be our fabric. Then we have our lining, our canvases, body canvas to be specific. These are some linen canvases. These are some wool canvases. We've got some horsehair, that's the chest canvas, color canvas, melton and felt, pocketing or silicia, domet, which is essentially something similar to a brushed cotton. We've got some wadding, sleeve head rolls, wing pads, shoulder pads, linen holland to stabilize and reinforce certain areas, some tapes, fusing, that's fusible interfacing to be specific, and our threads and buttons. Now let's begin with our fabric. As a professional tailor, you're going to be making jackets with all sorts of fabrics. So for example, here we have a linen and silk blend. It's very delicate, very thin, very soft. Here we have a heavier linen. It's kind of like a robust kind of fabric, it holds shape well, it doesn't crease that much, it's quite bouncy, or we've got some wool and tweed, and as you can imagine, the world of fabrics is infinite. But as a beginner, one of the most important things that you have to understand is that you must choose your fabrics wisely. And for that, I have three guidelines. First of all, don't buy expensive fabric. You're gonna be making a lot of mistakes and what matters at that stage is for you to gain experience. You do not want to gain experience at a high cost. You're going to be disappointed, waste a lot of money, and it's going to be demotivating. Second guideline, don't buy super difficult fabrics. Avoid velvets, sheer fabrics, stretchy fabrics, ultra super 1080s wool, thin fabrics, because you will be distracted by the handling of those difficult materials and not focus on the techniques. Third guideline is going to be don't buy super easy fabrics. Thick flannels, thick tweeds, anything that is going to cover your mistakes is a no-go. Why? Because although you want to focus on the techniques, you also want to see what you're doing. If you can't see the grain, for example, on a flannel, or you're working with a tweed that is going to hide all the bubbles and the small tensions or the misalignments of seams, you are going to develop bad habits. You're not going to be attuned to all the small things that are happening. So with all those guidelines that are actually somewhat restrictions, you might be thinking, what sort of fabric do I need to buy? The answer to that is plain midweight linen. Why? First of all, Linen fabrics, when they are plain in design and weave, have a very clear visible grain. Your construction lines on your pattern relate very closely to the grain of the fabric. We're going to cover that in upcoming lessons. To understand grain and the relation they have to your construction lines, you have to be able to see it in action. 
So whenever you're choosing a fabric, make sure that the grain is very visible, which is the case on linens. The other thing that is important is that a lot of linens are woven as a plain weave. That means that for every warp, you have one weft going through it. It's very different than a diagonal weave like a satin weave or a twill weave. Why is a plain weave important? Plain weave fabrics hold their shape quite nicely. When you're making something with volume, like a jacket, you don't want to be focusing on a difficult fabric that puckers and falls down and drapes in all directions. You want it to resemble your paper pattern as much as possible, and that is exactly what a plain weave linen does. The last thing is that the fibers of linen crease very easily. Whenever you're making a jacket, you're going to be handling it a lot. You're going to wrestle with it. And whenever you're wrestling with your garment, you want everything to stay as smooth as possible. That's the sign of a tailor that has control over the process. You don't want to crease it and crumple it up. And when you're done, you have all these creases that you can't get out. So linen teaches you to handle the garment with care so that when you're done, everything looks already pressed. Now, therefore, I have chosen linen as a fabric to teach you how to make a jacket in this entire course, and I recommend you do too. Let's now have a look at our trimmings. Trimmings essentially mean everything that you're going to use for your jacket apart from the fabric. Now, that's a bit too broad, so let's begin with our canvases to cover our trimmings, also known as wool canvases or HIMO. Body canvases are the best known trimmings that we have in tailoring. Everyone knows about them. Usually they're made of wool, goat hair, cotton, linen, viscose, sometimes polyester, or a combination of these. When we say a wool canvas, we generally mean there is some animal hair in there. People sometimes call it camel hair which is not really accurate because there's no camel hair in there, maybe back in the days, but nowadays they're usually viscose blends with a little bit of wool. Animal hair canvases, so wool canvases, are very bouncy. They have a lot of spring, they're crease resistant, and they're great if you want to make a jacket that upholds its shape without wrinkling. On the other hand, linen or cotton canvases crease quite a lot and they absorb a lot of moisture as well. So if you're making a jacket for a hot, humid climate, linen or cotton canvases are not so good. Now, as you can see, there are plenty of types of linen canvases. We have thick, heavy yarn canvases, fine yarn canvases for lightweight fabrics, or open weave linen canvases that is often used for waistcoats. There isn't really a particular reason for that. It's just that maybe people don't want to have too many thick canvases in a three-piece suit, for example. Now, if you are thinking, what is the best canvas to use for my jacket? That's a difficult question to answer. It's too broad. We can redefine that question by narrowing it to, what's the best canvas that I can use for my first jacket? The answer is simple. Any canvas that fits your budget. Why? Because the purpose of your first few jackets is to learn how to make a jacket. So the material isn't as relevant. It's relevant, but not that much. So once you know how to learn or how to make a body canvas or how to correctly insert it into your garment, then you can use any type of material that you wish, as long as you know why you're doing it. As a general guide, I would use wool canvases or animal hair canvases if you're making something for a hot, humid climate. You want it to be crease resistant, cool, and easy to shape. If you're making something for a dry and hot climate, then cotton or linen canvases are fantastic as long as you're comfortable with the amount of creasing that they do. Now, on top of our canvases, we use something called horsehair or chest canvas. Hair cloth is also what they call, or sido. Now that is this hyper bouncy material. It's even bouncier than the hair body canvas that I just showed you. This is inserted in the chest area of our canvas and that prevents this armhole area from breaking whenever we are moving forwards. It gives a very smooth surface 
to the chest of our jacket. Now, these horizontal lines that you see are the hairs. Woven into them are strands of cotton. This material is very strong in one direction and very weak in another. Look at that. Now, this bounce allows us to program our canvas and to choose which directions we want to reinforce. Sometimes a lighter version is available and that's called Sido. And Sido is almost like a stronger body canvas with tighter spun yarns. If you don't have access to horsehair, but you want to experience how it's like to use horsehair, you can double your body canvas in the chest area. That just shows you how to use that chest piece. And then once you can buy horsehair, you can replace it with that. If you can't find body canvas and you're thinking of, hey, can I make a jacket if I can't buy body canvas? Yes, you can still learn to make a jacket, just substitute it with calico. It's not ideal, but if you really have to learn how to make a jacket, then it's possible. Now, horsehair is usually covered with domet. Why? The hairs that we have on the edges of these horsehair canvases are very sharp. They can easily cut your skin. They're like needles. So therefore, whenever we are using horsehair, we need to have something thick and fluffy like domet, which is essentially a brushed cotton, to cover the raw edges of the horsehair. This domet comes in different sizes, different thicknesses. Some of them are super thick and fluffy, almost like upholstery material. Some of them are thinner and you can find them in all fabric shops as long as you know what name they use because not everyone uses the name domet. If you say brushed cotton, they usually have it. If you say domet, maybe it's a bit more specialized. Anyhow, once we use the domet and we have made up our body canvases, then we can think about things like pocketing, for example. Pocketing is a plain weave material, also called silicia. It comes in all types of colors and it's used to create pocket bags. But not only that, it's also made for reinforcing areas like the lapel, around the armhole, behind the jettings, behind the patch pockets and things like that. Now, what is so special about Silesia? I'm going to be very frank with you. There is nothing special about Silesia apart from the fact that it has a beautiful sheen and it comes in beautiful colors. If, for whatever reason, you cannot find Silesia, any high quality plain weave cotton fabric will do the job because you're making pocket bags or you're reinforcing the inside of a lapel. There's nothing fancy about the material that you're using there. Sometimes, Silesias are replaced by lightweight moleskins for overcoat pocket bags, for example, which have a very warm and fuzzy feeling to them. When you put your hands in the pocket, it feels nice and soft. Instead of moleskins, sometimes we use a material called selvet. I don't know why it's called that. Maybe it's a combination of silicia and velvet. I don't know. But it's similar to lightweight moleskin and again has a great soft feel. Whenever silicia or pocketing is heavily starched and woven with thicker yarns, it's called trouser pocketing and it turns into almost like a military tent material. It's super strong and lasts for decades. Um, silicias are sometimes woven as a plain weave or a satin weave. There isn't really a difference apart from how they drape, but when you're making a small pocket bag, the drape of your material is irrelevant. Now, speaking about reinforcements, we also have another material called linen holland. It was originally produced in Holland, as you can guess, and it's a linen fabric that is treated under a beetling machine. What is a beetling machine? It's something that takes the roll of the linen fabric, slowly spins it around, and as it's spinning, large mallets, wooden mallets, hammer down on the linen and flatten it. On top of that, it's also heavily starched. So when you wet it and you press it, it becomes so crisp that the edges can almost cut the fabric. Once we get to work with it, you'll experience it for yourself. It's quite something. That is what I have here in front of me. It doesn't look very nice and it also, to be honest, doesn't feel very nice, but they make 
great outbreast welts. Some tailors use them for reinforcing lapels and bridles and things like that, but we're just going to use it for our outbreast welt. Now, another type of reinforcement that we're going to use, which is one of the most important reinforcements that we have in jackets and coat making, those are going to be our tapes. Tapes come in all sorts and shapes. So, for example, we have linen holland tapes, which are a bit wide. They come in different widths. We have loosely woven hemp or linen tapes. We have densely woven cotton tapes or satin ribbons, which is what you'll use for gift wrapping. Now, what do we do with these tapes? We reinforce areas that are prone to stretching out. So, for example, the lapel area of your jacket, your front edge, the bottoms, or the bridle. You can also use them around the armhole or the back of the collar. The most important thing about these tapes is that they should have as little give as possible. Why? Because they are there to prevent an area from stretching. Sometimes tailors use bias lining tapes, which are stretchy, to prevent an area from stretching out. It's as if you're using water on a surface to prevent it from becoming wet. Nonsense. So, moving on to another type of reinforcement which tailors often hate, but nowadays they're inviting it a bit more and more into their workshops, and that is fusible interfacing. Now, since the 1950s, that's when this was developed, we have come a long way. Back in the days, tailors hated this. Why? Because it undermined their work. After all, you're padding something together and that takes a lot of skill, effort and time. And now you can suddenly bah, glue it together. And that glue, you know, when a tailor sees that, it's almost as an insult. So, but nowadays, these glues are very good. They are applied in the correct way. They're applied in the correct areas. And they don't cause the bubbles that old fusings used to create when the glue deteriorated. So we have very lightweight fuse, which is almost like a netting. It's see-through almost. And we use that in our jettings or the back of our pocket mouth just to stabilize that area and prevent those corners from fraying. It's not cheating. It's just using techniques to improve our work. But there is also heavyweight fusing with a lot more glue and heavier yarn, but a loose weave. This is very good if you're, for example, fusing velvets or areas where you don't want the fusing to make that area rigid. But if you want to have rigid areas like shirt collars, you can use a tightly woven cotton with a lot of glue and that, again, strengthens the fabric quite a lot. We don't use a lot of fuse in the lessons that we're gonna go through. We're only gonna use it in the corners and the insides of our jetted pockets. That's all. Now, after that, we have our beautiful wadding. This is one of my favorite materials because those of you who know me know that I love making shoulder pads. And the wadding is one of the best and main ingredients for making shoulder pads. We have different kinds. We have synthetic wadding, which is often used to create sleeve head rolls or wing pads. But we also have pure cotton wadding, which is always very thin, quite expensive if you want to have a high grade, and it easily flattens. For our Pagoda model, we're going to be using a blend between wool and cotton. Why? Because the wool gives it a lot of spring, while the cotton fills up the empty spaces between it. We don't want our shoulder pads to crush whenever we are sewing it together. You know, oftentimes when you make a shoulder pad, it starts out this thick, and then once you stitch everything together, it goes like to a layer of one centimeter. We want to prevent that. Now, as I said, shoulder pads are made of wadding, and they come in different sizes, different shapes, different widths, thicknesses, and all have a different impact on the shoulder line of your jacket. One misconception is that a good shoulder line necessarily needs a lot of padding. That's not true. It all depends on how you construct your canvas and your fabric and, of course, your pattern. But, as you can see, there are different types of shoulder pads in front of me. Some of them is something I've made myself, but other ones are ready-made. So, for example, this one uses a foam 
instead of wadding. Why a foam? Well, a foam is difficult to crush compared to, for example, pure cotton wadding. Now, as you gain experience, you will experiment with a lot of different shoulder pads. Some of them are rubbish, they look good, but when you put them in a jacket, everything goes wrong. And some of them are very thin, they look flimsy, they don't look like they have any power, but as soon as you put them in your jacket, things change for the better. So what I'd like you to do is to experiment with that, and in the upcoming lessons, I'm gonna show you how to make shoulder pad yourself. So that's gonna be very beneficial. Um, one thing I forgot was double-sided fusing. That's part of our fusible interfacing. It's used for gluing two fabrics together with this ribbon in between. It's very handy, especially for the corners of your jettings. Then we have our threads. Now we're gonna use a lot of threads and they're all different threads. So what do we have? We have, first of all, this big roll, which is a thick cotton thread used for mark stitching. Whenever you're mark stitching, you need to have a thick thread. Why? Because your mark stitches are gonna stay longer in the fabric than your basting thread is. And so when you're doing a few fittings, you want the markings to stay exactly where, where they were when you put them in there after you strike out your pattern. That helps you to navigate your way through the fittings. So that is mark stitching thread. Sometimes on heavier fabrics, you can use this thicker mark stitching thread as a basting thread. But if you're working with lining or lightweight fabrics, I don't recommend it. Then we have basting thread. Now basting thread is very soft cotton thread, easy to break, a baby can break it. And that is of course for when we are putting everything temporarily together so that we can do a fitting, rip everything off and redo the process. Do not use machine thread as your basting thread. It will damage your fabric whenever you're trying to pull the thread out. Your thread should be so easy to break that nothing damages, even if by accident the thread is pulled. Then we have overlocking thread. Now overlocking thread is very fine thread that we of course use for overlocking fabrics that are prone to fraying, but also for padding lapels or collars, or maybe felling a lining or sewing up a hem where the thread may leave an impression on the showing cloth. This is super fine. Um, I think there is a very fine one which is almost invisible, but you have different variations. So whenever you want to use a thin thread, make sure that you don't have the thinnest thread possible because they can easily break. But thin enough for you to do whatever you have to do without the thread showing through the fabric. Of course, we have button thread. When we are sewing our buttons, we need a strong thread, and that is usually a terco satin or a bonded nylon. Both of them are used in upholstery, in car, airplane seats, sometimes shoemaking, and anything that requires a lot of strength. Even military tents use them. Now, after the button thread, we have our beloved machine thread. These are polyester threads that we use for machining our seams. They are very strong. They could cut your fingers if you try to break them. And that's exactly what we want for our seams. Cotton thread or silk thread or linen thread is not really suitable for machining on the sewing machine because they don't last that long. They deteriorate very quickly. And the last thing you want is a seam to unravel. Then we have our buttonhole thread, also known as buttonhole twist or silk twist. This is a three-ply silk thread that is used to make buttonholes. It has a beautiful sheen and is used in combination with another thread that is called gimp. What is gimp? Gimp used to have a metal wire in between and around that metal wire was wrapped very tightly silk thread or polyester thread. Nowadays, it's not the case. It's just a few strands of thread with silk tightly spun around it. And it's used to elevate the buttonholes of our beautiful bespoke jacket. Whenever you see handmade buttonholes, they all look raised. That's because 
one layer of gimp was put around the cut edge of the fabric and on top of that the buttonhole stitches were done. So the knots of the purling stitches would sit on the gimp and provide a little bit more strength. Obviously every buttonhole needs buttons and so here we have a selection of buttons and the most frequently used button in bespoke tailoring is natural horn. Hopefully this is ethically sourced, no animals are killed for that, but if you're not comfortable with the idea of using horn, you can always use imitation horn, which is used by um, a lot of fashion brands and they are made from bio resins. These are natural resins that people find in wood or some of them are recycled. Nowadays, to be honest, people make buttons from everything, coffee beans, recycled plastic, um, cigarette ash, whatever you can think of. Um, but another type that is very expensive and shirt makers use it often is mother of pearl buttons. Those are harvested, they are found in the middle of the ocean and sometimes quite difficult to buy because sending them can cause issues with customs. Then the last thing we have on our board is going to be our silamide wax. Now our silamide wax thread is used to fill our linings. Traditionally, tailors used to wax their thread with beeswax. Then they would put it between two layers of fabric, put a hot iron on top, pull the thread through to remove the extra wax, and then they would go ahead and fail their linings. Nowadays, you don't have to do that. Waxing your thread takes a lot of time. So waxed threads are readily available that you can use. Silamide is a two-ply nylon. It's quite strong uh, and you can untwist the two-ply silamide thread to use one ply only if you want a very fine thread like an overlocking thread. Now let's look at our remaining materials. Lining as I mentioned is felt down usually by silamide wax thread but it can also be felt down by machine thread. Lining just like fabric has an infinite ocean of possibilities but what you have to know is that the main types of lining that people use, even high-end tailors, is viscose, polyester, silk, bemberg, or cupro. Now, silk used to be used back in the days. It's very expensive, but it's so lovely. It makes a sound whenever you crumple it up. It feels great. It has a good body to it, and it really enhances the garment. But sometimes some silks are very difficult to get into the garment because the purpose of lining partially is to help you to get in and out of your garment without getting stuck. Now, I personally am a big fan of Bemberg lining. This is an extremely fine, smooth, almost silk-like quality um, lining, which is very expensive, unfortunately, but it does certainly improve and increase the feel and the wear of the garment. Generally speaking, viscose is the most popular. Most high-end tailors use viscose or polyester, so don't think everyone uses silk. And it's readily available. A lot of you will struggle working with lining because it's extremely slippery. I mean, it's kind of like, almost like frozen ground. And whenever you're on the machine, it's so flimsy, your needle will poke through it, leave all these bruises, the bruises you can't get out it can be very frustrating. Please be patient. Sometimes cotton fabrics like silicia, like lightweight silicia is used as a lining. Not very advisable because again, you can't really get easily into the garment because natural fibers like cotton, linen, or silk sometimes have a lot of grip when they are in contact with one another. Having said that, then we have two more materials left. Let's begin with color canvas. Now, color canvas is a very stiff linen canvas. Sometimes people refer to it as French canvas or Japanese canvas, but what you have to understand is that these terms are dated. Back in the days, perhaps only France used to produce this type of canvas, and so people call it French canvas, but in a world where everything can be found online, where everything is centralized almost, these words are meaningless. What you have to understand is, what does it do? How do I use it? And where do I get it? 
because you can buy Italian canvas from China now and Chinese canvas from France and French canvas from Japan and it's all mixed up. Um, this is again heavily starched, very stiff, it does crease but that's okay. Um, it's heavy duty and it comes in again all sorts of colors and shapes. Some of them are really like starched to death. Whenever you steam them they turn into water like a soft, I don't know, pulpy thing and then as soon as they dry out they become super stiff. One thing that I would like to mention about color canvas is that it's often confused with buckram by let's say less experienced tailors. Buckram is very very stiff. It's like cardboard. It's hessian that is compressed and treated with glue or starch and is used to create very very rigid um, well, elements or, or panels. We don't as tailors use them that often unless we are doing military clothing. So having said that about color canvas, the last thing that we often use alongside color canvas is Melton or felt. Melton is a fabric. It is originally developed in Melton, it's an area in England and Melton is usually very expensive if you want to have high quality pure wool Melton but people make overcoats with it and sometimes the synthetic blends are a little bit cheaper. Why do we use Melton on colors? Because it provides a little bit body to that canvas because on its own as stiff as it is it sometimes is flimsy. The color receives a lot of pressure and therefore we need to have something that gives it additional strength. Melton does that perfectly. It doesn't easily uh, fray so you can just cut raw edges and sew a raw edge on top of another layer without having to seam traditionally or to turn in the edges when you're felling. But sometimes Melton is expensive, the color ranges are not that brilliant and so you need a substitute. You have two options or you use the same cloth as the jacket for the back of your color or you use something called felt. Now most of you know what felt is. It isn't woven, it's piled on top of one another and then punched and pressed and so you can mold it quite easily but once you stretch it out it's permanent. It cannot go back. Whereas Melton being a fabric can be stretched and then compressed back into shape. So that's the difference. But I personally prefer good quality felt. If you can find pure wool felt, that's great. If not, a synthetic blend for your first jacket will perfectly do. Do not worry about that too much. So that is really all the materials that an average jacket needs. Sometimes some jackets use more materials, additional ones, if they do embroidery or they need to have a special design element and others are simpler. They don't use horsehair for example or domet because they don't want to have additional warmth in the canvas or they don't use shoulder pads or the type of sleeve head roll that they use is purely made of one layer of canvas and nothing else. So there are variations but this should give you a good overview of what the average high-end tailored jacket requires. Back in 2014 when I was living in the Netherlands I decided to learn tailoring. I thought it was going to be super easy, I can go on Google or YouTube, find all the knowledge and then make a jacket. Not only did I not find the knowledge but I also couldn't find the materials and that was the annoying part. You know why? Because I couldn't even practice on my own and experiment and just play. So what was my problem? First of all I had to go and find all the different suppliers that potentially sold the materials that I thought I should be looking for. When I found them I didn't know which materials to choose and how much of each material. So you can already imagine how doubtful that can make you. Then there was the problem of not every supplier that I found had all the materials that I needed. So I had to buy two materials from one supplier, three from another, five from one abroad and all of them charged like astronomical shipping amounts. So I was paying more for shipping and the time that I was spending finding all these suppliers than just getting on with the work and learning of the techniques. 
you may go through the same process. In fact, I know that many of you who have been contacted me are complaining about why can't we find the right materials in our country? Why do we have to order everything from the UK or Italy or some other country that supplies it? And why are they always so bloody expensive if they are in a country where there aren't many tailors? Now, that is a problem. Why is it a problem? Because if I want to talk you through the steps of making a jacket, I cannot be successful if you can't find materials. So for that problem, we have a solution. Do you want to see it? Here it is. We call it purple box. What is the purple box? This box contains all the materials, exactly the same materials that I'm going to be using in the upcoming lessons to show you how to make a jacket from start to finish, assembled for you to the exact amounts that you need so that you can just get on with the work and not worry about which materials you have to order, how much, which supplier you have to find, and all of that. Now, we have a purple box for both models, the traditional model and the pagoda model. Let's begin by having a look at the materials that we have assembled for the traditional model. Let's have a look. Bah! The first thing that you're going to see is your bundle. Your bundle is wrapped up exactly the same way as a professional tailor would receive his or her work. When I was an apprentice on Savile Row, this is exactly how I would receive my bundle to work on it. At the bottom of our box, we have the patterns that I'm going to be using to make our jacket. You can just cut these out and you're ready to go. So let's remove our box and see what's inside our bundle. What you see here wrapped around our bundle is our sleeve head roll. This is made of wadding and bias canvas. It's going to help our sleeves to maintain their roll throughout the life of the jacket so that they're not crushed and kind of like flimsy looking. The canvas definitely helps with that. Wadding on its own is not going to be strong enough in some cases. Let's look at our body canvas. Our body canvas is wider than the average body canvas that's available on the market. This is a good thing. Why? Because it allows us to cut things on the double. Usually body canvases are very narrow and what you have to do is to cut things twice. That does not add to the experience that I want you to have when you're learning how to make a jacket. We want things to be easy and accurate. It's made of wool and viscose. The wool is very bouncy and the viscose gives it a lot of body and stiffness. There is some starch on it and this is really going to uphold the shape of our jacket. Let's have a look at our fabric. As I mentioned, linen is what I have chosen to show you how a jacket is made because a linen, when in plain weave, upholds its shape quite nicely. It shows the grain very clearly and also the creases. All I want you to do during the process of making this jacket is to develop good habits and linen does exactly that. Now, we have our viscose lining right here, which helps us to get in and out of our jacket. Whenever you don't have lining, it sometimes is very difficult to get in there. All these materials are going to grip your arms and prevent you from getting in. It's also very slippery, so if you haven't worked with lining, you may struggle. But rest assured, if you focus and have some patience, you'll get used to it in no time. Next up, we have our pocketing, also known as Celicia. This is made of 100% cotton, and we're going to use it to, of course, make our pocket bags. But we're also going to use it to reinforce certain areas like our lapels to give it a bit more body and a nicer roll. Then we have our horsehair. Now, our horsehair in combination with our body canvas is going to give our four parts a smooth look. As you can see, this does not crease easily, even if you use a hot or heavy iron. The warp, that's the length grain, is made of cotton and the weft, the horizontal grain, is made of horsehair. These hairs are quite sharp and if they rub against your skin or around your neck, that's where the brake line usually is, it's going to get itchy. So we need some domet to cover that up. 
Before we get to the domain, however, let's first have a look at our color canvas. Now, our color canvas is made of 100% linen. It's quite stiff. It's got some starch and we need all of that because the color is an area that receives a lot of strain. So we need a strong material to act as the skeleton of our color. Then we have our domet. I quite have a lot of, let's say, love for domet. I use it on shoulder pads. I use it in the chest area of the jacket and the domain that we have here is made of 100% cotton again and it's quite nice it's got a good quality a good feel to it and it really will prevent all these hairs from poking through then we have our marking thread this is again made of 100% cotton it's thicker than average basting thread and we need it to be thicker because it's supposed to stay in the fabric until we take it out. We don't want our mark stitches to disappear in the middle of the making process. Wrapped around it, we have two number five needles and number five needles are ideal for mark stitching. Any smaller, they're gonna be very difficult to thread and any bigger, you won't be able to make small bites to get accurate marking on your panels. Then we have some fray check. Now we need fray check whenever we're making buttonholes. It's going to be your best friend. But we're also going to use fray check on our front edges around our collar once we have cut these into the shapes that we want. It gives it a very strong edge and it also prevents it from fraying. You don't want to be making something that is fraying all the time. So fray check is going to help us with that. Then we have some thin fusible interlining this thin fusible interlining is almost like a net it's very very light and see-through we are only going to use it to give certain areas like the pocket mouths or the in breasts a little bit of stability so that we can work on it a lot easier and achieve good results then we have our linen holland as i mentioned linen holland will get very crisp once it gets wet and then dried with the iron and we're going to need that effect for the outbreast weld of our jacket well wrapped inside our linen holland we have a bunch of things so first of all we have our edge tape this edge tape is going to prevent certain areas from stretching out we're going to use this along our lapels our front edge the bottom of our jacket the back of our collar, around our armholes, and it's gonna help those areas to be strong and stretch resistant. Then we have our basting cotton, which is what we're gonna to use to baste up our jacket. It's slightly thinner than our mark stitching thread, and you're gonna use it on the single, whereas the mark stitching thread, you'll need a bit more of that because you're gonna use that on the double. Again, wrapped around it, we have two number five needles, which is in my opinion, the ideal size needle for basting anything. Then we have our machine thread, which perfectly matches the color of our fabric. And of course, whenever we are sewing anything, we have to make markings. And for that, we have three pieces of Jinbutsu chalk, which is a Japanese chalk. Tailors love it. So I think you deserve good chalk whenever you are trying to learn how to make a jacket. Bad chalk makes thick lines, it brushes out, or sometimes it stays in forever. And so this is not gonna do any of that. Then we have our shoulder pads. For the traditional model, I have chosen a standard one centimeter thick pad. It has nothing extravaganza to it. It's a standard pad just to soften the ends of those shoulders and to give it a bit of a smooth line. Now, after that, we have our buttons. Now, what you see as a package for our buttons is actually paper that we have left over in the workshop. So maybe sometimes you'll see lines or numbers or markings that I've made when I made a pattern. Our buttons are made of bioresin. It's imitation horn. It has the same effect and design as horn, but it doesn't have the risk of the horn being sourced from somewhere unethical, let's say. And I know that some of you are perhaps sensitive to that. After our buttons, we have our felt. Our felt is going to be padded to our color canvas and is gonna give our color canvas a lot of body. 
we need that body for the reasons that I explained. On top of our undercolor, we're going to put a thick layer of a cotton and viscose fusible interfacing. This is very soft and open weave, cut on the bias, and it's going to just cover all the steps that are going to go into the undercolor to prevent those steps from showing through on our main fabric. Last but not least, I have a few beautiful elements here hidden underneath the domat, and these are our yarns. First of all, we have some gimp with a number 18 tapestry needle. We're going to use the needle to get the gimp through the fabric to sew our buttonholes. It will elevate the buttonholes beautifully and show a lot of dedication and quality in the work that you're going to be producing. Then we have our selamide wax thread. Inside our selamide wax thread are three number seven needles. These are finer needles and we're going to use these to pad our collars, our canvases, our lapels and anything that requires finer needlework. In the upcoming episodes, I'm going to show you how to unwrap this, prepare this so that you can easily use it as tailors would in a workshop. Then we have our button thread that's bonded nylon with a number five needle and we're going to use this to sew our buttons. Whenever you're sewing buttons, it's always good to have a slightly larger needle for better grip. And the thread, of course, usually matches the button, not the fabric. Then we have our 100% silk thread for making our buttonholes. This is, as I said, called silk twist or buttonhole twist. And last but not least, we have a little bit of double-sided fusing, which we're going to use in the corner of our in-breast pockets. Now, one thing very important that I want to highlight. Everything that I have here in front of me is industry standard. This is the same materials that tailors all around the world, on Savile Row, Italy, South Korea, France, use to make jackets that are sold for 2,000 pounds, 3,000 pounds, 4,000 pounds. While I don't think you should have the most expensive materials, I believe that you should know what industry standard feels like. So that when you go tomorrow in a workshop and you do some work, you are familiar with the feel of all these materials. Having said that, let's go ahead and take a look in the purple box that we have assembled for our Pagoda model. As I've mentioned before, the Pagoda model is a more advanced model and it's therefore going to have more materials. You're going to feel a heavier box whenever it arrives at your door. So let's go ahead and see what it is that we have inside this box. As you can see, it's quite big. It's filled up the entire box and it may be a little bit difficult to get out, but we're going to do our best. So, just like the traditional model, this bundle is exactly wrapped up the same way that I used to receive my bundles when I did my apprenticeship on Savile Row. At the bottom of our box, we have the patterns that you'll need to make the jacket along with me. These are exactly the same patterns that I use in the lessons. So let's remove the box and have a look and see what we have inside our bundle. The first layer that we have wrapped around our bundle is going to be our sleeve head roll. Just like the traditional model, this is made of wadding and bias canvas and it will help us to maintain the roll of our sleeves. We're going to have roped sleeves, so we need a little bit more elevation right on the top of our sleeves and the canvas is going to help us with that. Now, one of the first things that you'll notice is that you have a lot more canvas with the Pagoda model than you have with the traditional model. This is because we're going to have extra pieces of reinforcements for the lapels, the skirt, the shoulders, and therefore we need more canvas. You can still cut the pieces for your jacket on the double so you don't have to puzzle around too much. Then we have our fabric. Now our fabric is also like the traditional model made of linen and it's got a lovely green color to it. Linen, again, because it upholds shape 
quite nicely. It shows the grain and all the creases. So it helps you to develop good habits. Then we have our lining. Now our lining is made of viscose and you will receive the same amounts that you had with the traditional model. It's beautifully green, matches with the fabric and the rest of our trimmings. It's very slippery, so if you have never worked with lining, you will have to get used to it. Let's move on to our Silesia, also known as pocketing. Our pocketing is made of pure cotton, and as you can see, it beautifully matches the green that we have. It's all color-coded. Now, inside our Silesia, we have a few things. The first things you notice is going to be this yellow packaging. What's inside? You're going to find out soon. Let's first put it aside and cover all the other materials that we have. So we have our horsehair, same amount as we had with the traditional model, but we're going to cut it differently. We're going to cut it on the bias. This horsehair is very high quality. It's got a great bounce. The length grain is made of cotton and the weft, which is the horizontal grain, is made of horsehair. It's the horsehair that causes that bounce. Then we have our color canvas. And now what you'll notice with the color canvas is that we have two pieces. Unlike the traditional model where we had only one piece for the color, which is right here, cut on the bias, we have an additional one, which we are going to use for our pagoda shoulders. And I know that most of you have been waiting for that for a very long time. So that is this extra piece cut on the straight grain. Inside it, we have very, very fine, thin, pure cotton fusing, which we're going to use to reinforce the jettings in our inbreasts, in our cross pockets, and some other areas. It's see-through and very, very light. So we're not gluing everything together. It's just there to add some stability. Then we have, let's see, then we have this white piece of fusible interfacing, which is heavier than the black one. It's cut on the bias and it's loosely woven. We're going to use this on our undercolor. A lot of layers will get attached to our undercolor and therefore we need something to go over them and cover up all the steps so that they don't show through on our top color. You'll see how we're going to use all of this. So then we have a piece of linen holland. Linen holland, as I described, will get very hard and rigid whenever it's wet and then dried off with the iron. And that's the effect that we want for our outbreast welt. Then we have our domet. Now, as I've mentioned before, these hairs will be very sharp. Whenever we make a canvas with horsehair in it, we have to find some way to cover those raw edges. Sometimes we use a tape just to cover the edges, but don't add any domet. But in our case, we're going to use domet to cover the entire horsehair and prevent anything from poking through the body of the wearer. Now, this domet is of high quality cotton. It's very dense, it's very robust, but at the same time, it allows you to mold it to whatever degree you have to mold it to whenever you're making your body canvas. Now, inside our domet, we have a few goodies. The first goodie that we have is our marking thread made of 100% cotton. It's slightly thicker than the average basting thread, and we're gonna use this to mark stitch our fabric. We need a thicker thread so that the thread stays in the fabric until we take it out. We don't want to lose our markings. Now, wrapped around our marking thread, we have two number five needles. This is the ideal size needle that you're going to have to need for mark stitching. Any smaller will be very difficult to thread, as I've mentioned before, and any bigger will prevent you from making accurate markings. So, let's put this right here. Then we have some fray check. Now, fray check is going to be our best friend whenever we are going to make our buttonholes because who wants their buttonholes to start fraying? It's a nightmare. We're also going to use fray check on the edges of our color once we have cut it to the shape that we want and our front edges. Sometimes some canvases are very fraying and we have to prevent them from fraying because the edges that we're going to work on should be as clean as we can get them. And fray check helps us with that. So here we have our fray check. Then we have our machine thread, which perfectly matches the color of our fabric. And we're going to use this to make up pretty much all machine work that we have to do and the seams and so on and so forth. So that's for our machine thread. Then we've got some buttons. And as I've said before, 
These packages that we make are made of leftover papers that we have in the workshop, so they're recycled and sometimes you may find a marking on them. So this had whatever marking that I made at the time when I was drafting a pattern and it just gives you a little bit of our workshop to you. Inside our packaging for our buttons, we have a few buttons and the design is based on natural horn, but it's not natural horn, it's actually bio resin. So this will give some of you who are sensitive to natural horn uh, a peace of mind that it's 100% ethically sourced and no animals were killed for just a few buttons. Let's put this aside. The last thing we have in our domet wrapped up is our edge tape. We're going to use this to create shape along our lapel to stabilize the front edge and to draw the sides in a little bit to make the jacket go around the body without breaking up. So now that you've patiently waited and gone through all of this, let's see what we have inside our yellow package. Inside our yellow package, as I mentioned before, is the material that we need for our shoulder pads. We're going to make our own shoulder pads. I want you to know exactly how you have to make them and therefore we need some wadding. Now this is quite thick so it will be quite easy for us to make the pads because otherwise you would need a lot of thin layers top on, on top of one another and that's not really ideal. So we have chosen a thicker wadding so that you need less layers. Now carefully open this wadding and what you'll see inside are a few more goodies, let's say. The first one is our basting thread. Our basting thread is thinner than our marking thread and just like the marking thread, it's made of cotton and has two number five needles. So let's put this next to the big brother here. Then we have three pieces of Jinbutsu chalk. Jinbutsu chalk is made in Japan. It makes beautiful markings, accurate, thin, sharp lines, is easily brushed away and doesn't leave permanent markings, which some of the cheaper chalks do. So that's that. Then we've got some threads. Now, what are these threads? The first one is GIMP, along with a number 18 tapestry needle. We're going to need GIMP to elevate our buttonholes and to give them a little bit more strength along the edge. Then we have bonded nylon. This is the thread that is very strong and we're going to use this for sewing up our buttons. Buttons will get a lot of use, so therefore the thread that we use for them has to manage that and shouldn't break easily. Along with our bonded nylon, we have a number five needle, which is the same length as our basting thread needle. And that is going to help us to get through those shanks and the necks of the buttons because sometimes they will get stuck and a longer needle is preferred. Then we have our waxed silamite thread, which is used for pretty much all hand sewing that we do. Inside it, there will be three number seven needles. These are finer needles that you need to pad your lapels, your collars, your canvases, and other areas where fine needlework is required. Now, in the upcoming lessons, I'm going to show you how to actually unwrap this and prepare it for easier use. Um, I'm going to show you how to do that exactly the way I was taught in the workshop that I used to do my apprenticeship. Then we have our pure silk thread. This is used, of course, to make our buttonholes. It's going to go on top of the gimp. And last but not least, we have a piece of double-sided fusing, which is going to reinforce the corners of our jettings. Now, all the materials that I have in front of me, just as I mentioned with the traditional model, are used by professional tailors all around the world. These are industry standards. In Japan, in South Korea, in Savile Row, in Italy, in France, tailors use these materials to produce jackets worth of 4,000 pounds, 3,000 pounds, and with some dedication and commitment, you will be able to do the same. One of the things that I would like to emphasize before we close off this lesson is that you don't need these bundles per se to follow along with our lessons. Our lessons are for free, will for always be, and they will be available at your demand. If you are a perfectionist, however, or you're living in a country where you don't have access to all the suppliers or all the materials, you would like to evaluate every step that you go through directly with what I have as a result, 
then these bundles are the right thing for you. There is a traditional model, there is a pagoda model, and if you go through both of them, you will learn the basics and then learn how to turn those basics into advanced skills. If you're interested in equipping yourself with these bundles for the journey ahead of you, simply go to our website, click on purple box, or click on the link in the description of the video, and that will take you there. As for now, my name is Reza, this was today's lesson, and I look forward to seeing the next one, hopefully with a bundle. Take care. Welcome to the International School of Tailoring. My name is Reza, and this is going to be your fifth lesson of how to make a bespoke jacket series. <laughs>